Welcome. There we are. People are joining. This is wonderful. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, oh, there we go. Lance is being joined in. I'm going to spotlight my hand. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our LKO 2023 for uh, this year. Uh, we're excited. Oh, I can't. Oops, am I muted? No, there we go. Here we go. We're gonna remove. Oh, I hear you loud and clear. Okay, great. There's no other reason I can't get rid of that. Um, we'll just welcome everybody. Nice to see everybody. Um, we are excited to uh, have you here today or this evening rather for our uh, Love Your Lake 2023, as I say. Um, and my name is Kirsten. And uh, on behalf of the LKO board, which consists of Jan, Wendy, Tanya, Kathy, Scott, another Scott, Dale, Marilyn, and Gary. We're really happy to bring these seminars to you today, um, our L to you this evening, rather, our LKO community. They're obviously meant to be informative for you, to bring communities together, and for all, all of us to learn how to protect and bring awareness uh, about our beautiful, beautiful lake. So as a reminder, um, this, session is, this session is being recorded. Um, so it'll be available for those that are not able to see uh, be here tonight um, and that will be on our YouTube channel. So just make sure that you know that it is going to be recorded. So behave. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, as a reminder, our guest speaker this night is Dr. Chris Hauser. Um, he'll be speaking uh, on the relative importance of recreational boat waves and wind waves. Um, as we've done in other uh, sessions that obviously at the conclusion of the seminar, you will be able to ask questions, keeping yourself muted um uh throughout the entire time would be helpful um and use that chat function to write your question in and during our question and answer period we'll be able to answer or chris will be able to answer your um uh questions or or provide us with any comments um i don't think we have anything else to mention other than we'd like to get the evening started and so I'm going to introduce to you, um, and I'm going to remove myself as a spotter here. <laughs> there we go. Uh, this is Tanya Smith. She's a, a member of the LKO board, and she is going to read our land acknowledgement. As we gather here today, we res respectfully acknowledge that we are situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe Mississauga lands and the traditional territory covered by the Williams Treaties. Kashikwigamog, an Anishinaabe name meaning lake of long and winding waters, served for a millennia as an important passageway and meeting area for the First Nations people. We are grateful for the opportunity to live here and we thank all generations of Indigenous people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tanya, for that. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, without getting uh, further ado, I'm going to get everything started. We're gonna, I'm going to introduce you, Wendy Hampson. She's also on the board and she's our LKO membership. I'm going to ask her to do the introduction uh, for tonight for of our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Chris Hauser. It's my distinct honor to introduce Dr. Chris Hauser, who is the Acting Dean of Science at the University of Windsor, as well as the Interim Vice President of Research and Innovation and a professor in the School of the Environment. He is also the Editor-in-Chief of the publication Physical Geography. Dr. Hauser joined the University of Windsor as Dean of Science in 2016 and was previously a professor at Texas A&M University in, in the College of Geosciences. As a coastal geomorphologist, his research is focused on shoreline change, beach dune interaction, rip currents, and beach safety and vessel generated wakes. We very much look forward to hearing about his ongoing research on boat wakes in cottage country as they have become rather a hotbed topic. Dr. Hauser, it's all yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm just gonna switch it to presentation mode. And again, thank you to everyone for this invitation to present on some of the work that we have been doing relative to recreational boat wakes in Northern Ontario. And it's something that 
um, I've actually been working on for a number of years and uh, uh, the pandemic actually is what really drove a lot of the most recent research because we couldn't go anywhere and the easiest spot to go was the cottage. So it decided to throw some instruments in the water and I'll, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. Just as some background, as, as Wendy introduced, I am at the University of Windsor in the School of the Environment. I have been the Dean of Science since 2016 at the university, and currently I'm seconded as the Interim Vice President of Research Innovation. Prior to that, I was at Texas A&M University as a professor in the School of, uh, or the College of Geosciences, and my very first academic position was at the University of West Florida in Pensacola, Florida, basically Southern Alabama, um, in 2004 to 2007, but I'm originally from Ontario. I grew up in Huntsville. I know the region quite well. Uh, Joe Stocking, a member from um, the Ministry of Natural Resources, took me to your lake when I was a young when I was a young kid, and we went snorkeling there. My father was a assistant deputy minister for natural resources. Worked at the Frost Center for many years, and uh, we I still spend a large part of my summer in the the Perry Sound region now. So I'm, I, part of the move back from Texas was to get back home. As introduced, my research is, is quite varied. Uh, we do a lot of work with respect to Great Lake, Great Lakes shoreline erosion, uh, rip currents and beach safety, as well as beach dune interaction, which I'll explain here in a little bit more in a second, as well as some very advanced geospatial analysis techniques to be able to do automated mapping um, using satellites and, uh, and drones. You may have seen some of our work previously, something called Coasty. So Hurricane Fiona hit the Maritimes in the, in the fall. And you will have seen there are these images of the beach dune system before and after Hurricane Fiona. That is our project. We are the main uh, data collectors for Parks Canada in the Maritimes uh, through this Coasty program. And you'll have seen the, our photograph probably on the National, like CBC, the National, et cetera, before um, her, Fiona after Fiona and the amount of erosion that actually occurred. And we've been now starting to follow it through and understanding how it is in fact recovering. And that is actually something that if you have, a, if you have other locations in Ontario uh, adjacent to large bodies of water, we'd be interested to talk to you about our Coasty program expanding into Ontario. But that's not what I'm here for. What I'm here for is to talk to you about boat wakes. And I started working on boat wakes in 2008 when I got hired by the National Park Service of the United States to look at a problem associated with uh, the erosion of the marshes near Fort Pulaski on the Savannah River. Now, Fort Pulaski is a Civil War fort. It was a battle site during the, the Civil War, uh, but it is also the location for a new um, gas plant and, and depot. And as a result, it was moving from what were called Panamax ships, ships that could move through the Panama Canal, to post-Panamax ships, ships that were too big for the Panama Canal and had to go around South America and um, Africa. These large ships were going to be coming up the Savannah River, and they were concerned that, in fact, they were going to cause erosion. They, in fact, weren't the reason for the erosion. If you see that in the little video that's playing, you'll see a little tiny blue boat going by the big boat. The little blue boat was the problem, not the big boat. And that was part of our study, looking at what was causing this marsh erosion. Now, these boats, these large cargo vessels and the pilot boats, those blue boats, were in fact, um, were causing an extreme increase in the wave activity. And that wave activity was able to resuspend a large amount of sediment. So the graph that is shown there, the blue is the boat weight going through. It's measured in velocity, how fast was the water moving underneath the wave. And the gray is the actual amount of sediment that was being suspended. So whether on the tidal flat, lower down, or right on the marsh environment, in fact, these ships were creating waves that were resuspending a large amount of sediment that was then picked up by the river and moved out to the Atlantic Ocean or potentially even onto Tybee Island. But what we were finding is that, in fact, it wasn't the cargo vessels like the one you saw there, but the pilot boats. So for every cargo vessel, there's two pilot boats that go back and forth. And so, and these are the ones, these are the boats that take the pilots out to, to in fact, be to, to drive the vessel down the Savannah River or, or remove it back out. So these pilot boats were actually creating the problem. 
But the bigger issue associated with this marsh, it wasn't the boats as much as it was those shells. If you look in that, in the background there, you will see all these oyster shells laying on the ground. It was the oyster shells that were laid down by the Army Corps of Engineers in the 1950s to protect the shoreline. They were being moved by the pilot boats and the cargo vessels. Every time they passed, they would simply pick up that shell and move it along. Eventually, it smothered all the vegetation, killed the marsh, and the marsh fell apart. So the boats were responsible, but not because of direct impact, but because they were able to pick up those oyster shells. Now, we were able to look at this, and this really raised one of the first questions. If these boats were important, were they as important, less important, or more important than the wind waves? Now, we're on the Savannah River, so it's a fetch-limited environment. Fetch is the description of the distance over which the wind blows. And what we actually found is that the, the wind-generated waves were large. They represented a, a large amount of the total wave energy and wave force. But when you looked at mid-tide, the exact spot when the waves were hitting that front of the marsh, where it was starting to break down, the cargo vessels, the pilot boats, were almost as much energy as the wind waves. So basically, at the exact point in tide that would cause the erosion, boat wakes, the vessel generated waves were based, doubled the normal amount or natural amount of wind wave activity. Now, again, they themselves just hitting the marsh weren't the problem. It's because they were able to pick up the oyster shells, kill the vegetation, which then allowed the marsh to collapse. But it raised some interesting questions and was one of the very first studies to look at how important are in fact boat wakes. Now, since that time, um, in, I've started to work in other areas. And one I'll, I'll focus on is from 2018, 2019. This is from Lake Conway chain of lakes in the Orlando area of Florida. Now, this particular lake uh, is very popular for wake boats, but it's very popular because it is the location where during the Australian summer, the Australian wakeboard team comes to practice. So almost on a 10 minute cycle, there is a wake boat going by with the Australian team during the middle of the Australian winter and our summer. And it was creating large wakes. But the reason for this lake being so important is that the National Wakeboarding Association, a lobby organization, in the United States used this lake to monitor boat wakes and to figure out whether in fact they were causing a problem. And there is a paper by, a, 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 not a paper, it was actually just a simply consultant report by Goudet and others in 2015 that was about the characterization of wake sport wakes and their potential impact on shorelines at Lake Conway. And what they found is that if you, from about, as you move through about five different sensors, the blue one on the bottom is right where the boat is. And as you move away towards the closer to shore, the purple at the very top, the boat wakes get smaller because of dispersion. So one of the things that happens with wakes, and I'm not gonna go into it too much, but the speed of a wave is directly related to its period, the time between crests. So the longer the time between crests, the faster that the wave actually moves. So when the wave is first generated at the boat, you've got some really long waves that are really clumped together. But through a process called dispersion, the big long waves travel faster and, and, and really stretch out that entire wake. The long waves go faster, the short waves go slower. So it's like an accordion being pulled apart and the long waves get there first. So if you've been sitting at your dock and are at the shoreline, you'll notice that these really long, small waves come in first, and then the really short, big waves come in second. That is because of dispersion. How they come into your shoreline depends upon how far you are away from the sailing line of the boat. But from this particular graph, Goudet and others said that in fact, boat wakes were not a problem. And what they said is they, they did a bunch of measurements. They said, okay, if, 
Here's my wave height right at the edge of the boat. And here's the distance from the boat. I apologize, it's in feet because it was a US study, but they did wake surf shallow, wake surf deep, cruising shallow, cruise deep, wakeboard shallow, and they got all these curves. And they basically argued that wakes were not a problem within 300 feet of the shoreline, 100 meters. But if you look very clear, carefully at the shoreline, even at 300 feet, these waves are still five inches in height. And if you know that the cottage country lakes, not all of them, we, we sometimes we can, get the, we can get big waves generated when the wind goes down the right angle of that lake. But many times we don't get five inch waves. But also if you look at wakeboard deep, this purple line, it actually flattens out at 10 inches, almost a foot wave. That's a big wave, even at 300 feet from the sailing line. But from this graph and the previous graph, Goudet and others argued, wake boats have no impact. So we did a study at Lake Conway. We were hired by their cottage association to study. And so here's the Australian team going by in their boat and you can watch the wake go. That is less than 300 feet from the shoreline. And so we did a, 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 a consultant report to look at the actual amount of wake sport wakes uh, and, and their impact on that shoreline. And if you watch that wake come in, and I apologize, it's a second here to watch. You can already see the really long wave the boat to hit the shoreline. They've already dispersed and the boat wake is now starting to hit with these really long waves. And now the next size of wave is coming in. You're getting that energy coming in. It's dispersing still a little bit, kind of still expanding out. But you can see those big waves about to come towards the shoreline. Well, you can't tell me that boat wakes have no impact because the biggest indication of the problem is that if you look at this person's shoreline, it is cement. The only way that they actually had a shoreline still is because they had to put up this cement break wall to stop the boat wakes coming through. So we were asked by this organization to figure out whether or not these wakes were a problem. Now, I can't tell you whether or not they're causing erosion or not because they've got a break wall there. But what I was able to look at was the basic assumptions of the Goudet report. And so, I'm not going to a lot of detail here, but I reversed and analyzed all of their data. And then what I did is I did a simulation of what would be the, the size of a wave generated by wind moving across that lake. And if I used their assumptions, yeah, I was finding that wakes were only like 4%, 10% of the energy, but I caught a problem. They were basically assuming that the boat was on the very, very far side of the lake. Well, you know, that's not the issue. The issue is not about the wake coming across an entire lake. It's about the wake that is being generated directly adjacent to the shoreline. So the most important thing about the table, and again, it's a lot of detail here for you, but what I was able to demonstrate is that wake boats traveling less than 1,000 feet from the shoreline represent, apologize, there's a grammar error there, represent more than the total wave energy generated by wind. So while they created this data set that made it look like boat wakes were not a problem on Lake Conway, what we found is that if a boat was traveling less than 1,000 feet from shoreline, they were either 50% or 100% of the total wind wave energy. There were still wind waves being generated here, but basically you are doubling the amount of energy impacting the shoreline. And it's the reason why these cottage owners, I guess they're not cottage owners, they are residents of this lake, had to put in cement break walls. So from that Lake Conway study, all of a sudden the pandemic hit and I can't go anywhere, I can't do anything but I've got a bunch of instruments. So I go to my cottage lake, Whitestone Lake, just north of Perry Sound. And in this picture here, you'll see the boat that we have, and that's my son driving the boat. And 
what I did is spent a lot of time during the middle of the pandemic with a drone and my son driving a boat so that we could capture as many different types of boat wakes as possible and start looking at the issues. Now, boat wakes, and you can see it from this photograph, and maybe I'll, I'll restart the, um, the video. It doesn't want to, but there we go. Restart the video. There's two types of waves that are generated by a boat. The first one is called the diverging wave. That's the one that comes off the bow, the white water that you see on the edges of the boat that he's generating. The second wave is called the transverse wave. And this one is harder to see on this boat because we've got some wind waves on the water. But these are waves that you will see at the back of a boat that look kind of like a rolling wave. Where those two connect, where the diverging wave and the transverse wave overlap each other, you get your biggest wave, the cusp. And that's what really determines what's the size of the wave that is actually going to be generated at your shoreline. Now, some of the controls on what determines how big a wave will be is depending upon how you drive your boat. The first one is displacement. This is my son again driving. He's in displacement mode right now. Flat water, virtually no wake being generated. He's eventually going to start the boat here. Now he starts to boat. He starts to boat. And all of a sudden now he is into transition. You can see the size of the wake being generated. And eventually he moves himself up to planing speed. So part of it is that if you are in displacement mode, you create virtually no wake. If you are in planing, you create a smaller wake. If you are in transition, that plowing action, you create a big wave. That is the entire focus of creating a wake boat, is to have those large wakes being generated by keeping yourself in that transition mode. Display, ultimately, you want to get yourself to planing. And I do apologize. I realize now that I'm demonstrating outreach videos without life jackets on my boat captain. So something to change for next year. What controls that size of the wave is something called the fruit number. And the fruit number, I'm not going to, is, is a ratio of the speed of the wave, the velocity of the vessel, divided by the square root of gravity times the length of the vessel. Now, I'm, I'm going to give you a better description of what this means in a minute. But basically, it's the speed of the wave based relative to how quickly it is leaving the size of the boat. If that ratio is really small, less than one, you are in this simply displacement mode. You're in the spot where you've got relatively small waves being generated. Your transverse waves and your, your displacement your, your diverging waves are not connected to each other. They're traveling at different speeds. And so as a result, you're not combining waves together. And in fact, at really slow speeds, you don't get much of a wake because you're not pushing the water and your wakes are canceling each other out. But as you begin to increase your speed, then as a result, you then have this, that diverging wave is starting to reach and become close to the transverse wave. And as a result, they start to combine. So when you're going really, really slow, the waves are small because you're not pushing and they cancel each other out. As you increase your speed, you start to push more into that plowing mode, but you also create a speed at which the waves that are being generated start to add together until the point at which you get what's called critical, which is exactly when the speed of the wave is directly related to or equal to the square root of gravity times the length of the vessel. And it's at this exact spot that the, the, the diverging wave that's generated at the bow meets up and is perfectly at the exact spot of your transverse wave. So you, what you have, instead of having two separate waves, you put two together and you get your biggest wave and you are plowing directly into the water. Once you get a little bit faster, the waves start to separate again, and you get into something called supercritical. You can also do it by what's called water, you can do it by using water depth. So instead of using the length of the boat, we can do it in terms of the depth of the water. So now the ratio is the velocity of the vessel divided by the square root of acceleration due to gravity times the water depth. This really determines how quickly you are pushing a boat. 
So you might want to look at me if you can see me in the background here in the in the picture. If you have a perfectly still water and you throw a pebble into the water, it creates a ripple that creates concentric circles. That's because there is no speed to the water and the speed of the wave, the wave is actually moving away from it. The speed of a wave is the square root of gravity times depth in shallow water. So if you've got still water, you get these concentric circles. But as you increase, let's say you throw a, river, you throw a pebble into a river, the river is moving. Now you don't get concentric circles, you get one side of it developing faster than the other. Eventually, if the wave that you are generating is the exact same speed as your boat, it can never get away from your boat. And as a result, you constantly are pushing it. So the more you push the wave at the exact same speed as the wave, the bigger it gets. So in very deep water, we tend to get relatively small waves because you're creating a wave that is moving much either is moving much slower. Sorry, <coughs> didn't mean slower. I mean, much faster than the boat. It's moving in deep water. It can move really, really fast. As it moves really, really fast, it gets away from the boat quickly. As you get to critical, this means that the boat is moving at the exact same speed as the wave, and it's basically plowing like a snow plow all the water in front of it. And that's where you get your biggest wave. And if you, if you maximize the speed and the length of your boat, you can get some big waves. So a large part of the generation of wakes has to do with your speed and your length, and then the driver and their ability to get up onto plane as quickly as possible. So with that in the background, what we've been doing over the last couple of years is looking at some re can, can key research questions for Northern Ontario. What is the relative importance of wakes based upon the lake size, the shape, the shoreline type? How do wakes disperse relative to vessel type, speed, sailing line, et cetera. What is the impact of boat wakes and sound on shoreline habitat? And also what is the public perception of boat wakes? Do people think they're a problem or not? And we just want to better understand. I will note, as you saw from the pictures of my son driving a boat, we drive boats, we go water skiing, we love to water ski. And so I've got no stake in this game, but it represents an opportunity to better understand how are they changing our shorelines and what, what do we need to think about when it comes to boats on our lakes? Now, a wave that is being generated, and here's a perfect example. You can see the diverging waves going off to the side. You can also see the transverse waves coming off the, the, the stern of this boat. When a boat comes through the water, it disturbs that water. The amount of disturbance depends upon how fast it's going, the length of the boat, and really how that is interacting with that that water that is being displaced. But what you generate is first a wake. That is the wave being generated by the boat. If you look at the background of this video, you'll see that it's a rocky shoreline. Rocky shorelines mean that you reflect waves. So most of the waves on this particular stretch of water reflect directly off that shoreline and create a secondary train of waves that are reflected. But because they're reflected, they then reflect off the other shoreline and come back and eventually they become residual waves. And I'll show you a, bit of, a better example in a second. So there are three parts to a wake. The actual wake generated by the boat, any reflected wave coming off an adjacent shoreline, and the residual waves, which is the final components of all the reflection that might have occurred. Now this wake that I, example wake that I show you on the bottom, that is, the, a wake that was generated around 200 seconds after we started sampling and didn't finish till almost 1,000 seconds. That was 800 seconds of one wake. 800 seconds is well more than 10 minutes. So this one boat that went through created 10 minutes of wave activity on the lake. The most important one was the one that was generated right with the wake, but you can even see that the reflected wave still created quite a bit of energy. Apologize, I missed one. 
So what we did is we, in 2020, we threw some sensors into the water at Whitestone Lake. And we measured both non-wake, so wind waves, and they would come through and you would see that they would spike during frontal storms that would come through, a cold front that would come through. And then we also measured the wakes and we were, I'll show you how we separate those later. And you can see that the wakes as they were coming through, you can see Canada Day, the civic holiday was really big, August civic holiday, Labor Day. You got some big peaks in August was pretty busy and that's exactly when we were on the lake as well. And that's the best time to go to, to our particular lake. When we started to add this up from the end of May through to the end of September, what we found is that through the month of June, wind waves were important, but through July, August, and most of September, boat wakes were the primary source of the cumulative wave energy. So just by taking the actual wake, we found that recreational boat wakes accounted for about 60% of all wave energy in 2020. And I realized I just missed a slide. To give you an idea, this is what Whitestone Lake looks like. It's just north of Perry Sound. We were measuring here at this little red dot, the sampling site. That's where my cottage is. And it's right down the, one of the longest fetches of the lake at about two kilometers. So we get some very strong west winds that will come down that fet, that arm, and create some very foot to foot and a half large waves during the frontal storms. But when we measured the wakes, we found that they accounted for almost 60% of total wave energy in 2020. I will note that we have had that sensor in the water ever since, because as you know, we've gone through COVID where everybody's at their cottage and buying boats to, oh my God, I've got to go back to work in Toronto. I got to sell my boat. I'm no longer at the cottage to high gas prices and high inflation. So boating activity from year to year is highly variable. So we have kept this sensor in the water as one of our controls to better understand what is the interannual variation in wave activity. Now, as I mentioned, wakes aren't just the wake. There's reflected waves and there's residual. So if I just looked at the reflected waves, what we actually found was on Whitestone that, way, that the boats accounted for almost 80% of all the wave energy. And in fact, we then did a comparison. We did all the, the, the reflected and residual waves relative to the total wave energy. And we realized that in fact, most of the wakes, most of the waves were actually wakes. And you can see in this one picture here from a normal day, you can see the wind waves coming down the lake. They're going through the middle of the picture, but there are seven different wakes on this photograph at one time from seven different boats, all of them reflecting off of the adjacent shorelines. So it was adding up quite a bit. Now, 2020 was a bit of a problem for us because that was also a year where we were a headwater lake. So we are the, there's no streams that come into us. We are the original supply of water down the Magneto to the Whitestone River to the Magnetowan River. And 2020 was an extremely high water level. We had to completely move the water pumps, everything. And in fact, you, these waves are moving right across our, our cement dock, our platform. So these wakes, when they were coming in, at high water levels, we're actually causing damage to our infrastructure. And that's something to consider. It's not just wakes in general, but it might be wakes during periods of high water level, whereas low water level may not be the same impact. Now, one of the other things that we noticed during this time is jet skis. Jet skis are typically identified as having small wakes, but that's because the assumption is that they just go flying past shoreline. But if you've ever watched a bunch of jet skiers, rarely do they ever just go flying past the shoreline. They tool around. I will tell you, every summer we have jet skis, and I know I tool around. But that represents a big source of the wave energy. And it's amazing. So if you just look, I'm just going to pause it here. Look at the waves on this lake. The vast majority of what you see in that picture is just these two jet skis. There's a little bit of wind wave up here, very small little bit of chop, but you can see another boat has gone through here. Jet skis are a major contributor by the, by the behavior. So last year we moved our study to include Muskoka Lake um, and worked with Safe Quiet Lakes 
to be able to put out a, a about seven sensors across the uh, lakes Joseph and Rosso, as well as in Lake Muskoka. And what we're doing is looking again at that relative importance. This is a very different set of structured lakes, different orientation, different shoreline, and there's a much larger fetch. So we wanted to better understand if you've got a bigger, if you've got a bigger lake, do you find that boat wakes are even a problem? So here's just some of the preliminary data. One of my grad students is currently working on this at, at this moment, and hopefully we'll have some data that we can share with you by midsummer. This is just June 11th of 2022, and it's a really warm day. A lot of boats were out on the lake. And what I'm showing is two of the different sites that we had. Yellow is our main host site. Uh, and it is open to that water. And that's actually this video. This is the background picture to what it is. Big open area, large wave, uh, wind generated waves and boat wakes kind of are hidden in it. And you can see some boat wakes that come through. Here is one boat wake, two right here. There's a bit more coming in here, three, four, five, six. There was boat wakes there, but the wind waves, these smaller waves were just as big. Here, we were actually finding that wakes were about 60% of the time. I can't read my own numbers because you guys are in my, your, your pictures are in my way of my data, so I can't even read my own slide at the moment. The wakes were about 60% of the time, but they only represented 38% of the energy. When you go down to a different part of the lake, the waves were coming in at a different angle. We found on that exact same day, the wakes only accounted for 24% of the time but represented 50%, 58% of the total energy. So the orientation of the lake, the wind, the shoreline type, et cetera, has a major contribution to what may be or may not be a problem. And this is what we are working on right now. Now, this is the, you can see these images. So these blue scatter plots, and it's kind of line graphs at the very top. This is a measure of wave heights. So what's on here on the, on the y-axis is pressure. So you, as it goes up and down, it's a measure of the wave. So this is time on the x, pressure on the y, and each one of these up and down motions is a wave. The bigger ones and that are packets, those are boat wakes. And you can see a little bit better on the second one here, small little tiny wind waves, big boat wave comes through, little tiny wind waves. These little colorful graphs that are behind, be below them, are called wavelet graphs. And so what we're able to do is just like an accordion, pull apart all those different waves and look at them by period, and then look at them by energy. So the areas of red are higher energy, the areas of blue are lower energy, and the period is how many seconds between wakes. The way we can identify a boat wake is that it has this backwards comma type look to it. So whenever we see this backward comma, we are able to identify that as a boat wake. And what we've been doing is a lot of machine learning with this data set, being able to automatically extract boat wakes so that it's an automated process and not an undergraduate student sitting there trying to identify where every boat wake is over an entire summer. But we're able to then pull that data out, calculate the time of boat wakes, the energy of them, the periods, et cetera. Again, this data will be coming out later this summer. Last year, we also ran a study at Lake Rosalind near Hanover uh, in, in central Ontario. It's a very small lake, maybe only 500 meters wide um, and maybe two meters at its deepest spot. But it's got three wake boats on this little tiny lake that go around and around and around. And so we put the sensor out there in the month of August and what I'm showing you here on this bottom graph is the entire month of August. And you can almost see like, you can see the daily pattern of boat wakes going through. And then Saturday through Friday, August 20th to 26th, just to highlight that data, to show that in fact, there are no waves during the night. And the waves pick up at about nine in the morning and they go right through to nine at night. Virtually 100% of all the wave energy on this small lake small wind waves is associated with wakes and primarily with the three wake boats that are on the lake. That data um, is going to be presented to their cottage association on Sunday afternoon and we should have the final data analysis for it. But what's really interesting about this is that these wakes 
are the primary or suspected to be the primary cause of the algal blooms that are being generated on Lake Rosalind. So every time one of those wakes come through, we are finding that the actual period of the wave is around three to five seconds. Wakes with a period, again, the time between crests of three to five seconds in shallow water means that the wake is able to penetrate all the way to the bottom and resuspend sediment as well as mix the water column. So it's not just about the wake hitting the shoreline, it's also about offshore, is that wake able to touch the bottom? And if it touches the bottom, does it resuspend sediment? And is it mixing the water column? If you have no boats on a lake, you will get a very warm upper layer, a cold bottom layer, and you will know when you're swimming exactly where that thermocline is. When you've got a lot of boats going through, you mix the water and you have a much deeper, deeper thermocline, a much higher, warmer temperature at the top. You're mixing that water. On this lake, the wind waves, which only have a period of about one second, only penetrate to a depth of maybe one meter near the shoreline. So all of the sediment resuspension and temperature fluctuations in this lake are largely due to the boats. This is something that has been seen in many other locations. This is data, I forgot to put the reference here in the bottom corner. This is data from Florida, it's not my study. It's a study that was done in some of the, in some of the intercoastal waterways. And you can see a boat going through and you can see the sediment being resuspended behind it in shallow water. And it's something to consider that depending upon where the boat is, how big the wave is, you might have a large amount of sediment being resuspended. We, don't, we do notice that in, and it's anecdotal and it's something that we're wanting to study this coming year, that wherever we have direct exposure to boat wakes, not wind waves, but boat wakes, we tend to find very little slime on the rocks, little resuspended materials, and we tend to find the water more turbid. We've also found in Whitestone Lake that some of the algal blooms are also in the location where you've got the largest concentration of boat wakes. So what we're finding is that this is having an impact on sediment resuspension, water mixing, but also the purpose for this particular picture is that about two years ago, right where that boat is going through in the middle of the picture used to be a marsh in the middle of the lake. There is no marsh there anymore. The vegetation is simply being taken out either directly by the boat or by the wake resuspending sediment and ripping the, the vegetation out. So that raises the question, can we just plant vegetation on the shoreline and protect the shoreline? Well, if you're on a natural lake in Northern Ontario that has big waves that come through naturally with the wind, Typically, you've got a rocky shoreline. You don't get a lot of vegetation. That should tell you a lot right there, because if you don't have vegetation, it's a rocky shoreline. Vegetation has a hard time getting taking hold at that location. But it does raise the question, OK, can we plant vegetation? Now, the graph in the bottom right corner is a, is a data set that we collected back in 2015 to better understand the drag associated with different types of vegetation relative to the size of the wave. And I'm, I'm, what I'm just doing is showing you the graph that we use to calculate this, simple, this very simple calculation. I'm not going into it, but also the publication that you can have access to. And I will note that any of the publications that I've identified tonight, uh, if you email me directly, I'll be able to send it directly to you free of charge. Just because otherwise you got to go through the paywall of every publisher to get the publications. What we actually found is that based upon both lab and field studies, um, to get rid of boat wakes on Whitestone Lake, my cottage lake, would require a five meter wide zone of emergent vegetation at a depth of one meter. That is, it looks nothing like the bathymetry of my lake. And to have five meter swath of vegetation doesn't take hold because I don't find that anywhere naturally on that lake. So more vegetation is needed to actually attenuate the boat wakes. We ran a study this past year on the Detroit River at a place called Pesh Island. Uh, and in fact, Pesh Island is where J.P. Weiser, if you, if you drink whiskey, J.P. Weiser, uh, that's where his um, little resort was and his uh, stables were on this little island in the Detroit River. But it's eroding at an extremely fast rate because of the big cargo ships that move up and down um, the Great Lakes. 
So what we did is we used some artificial vegetation with a diameter of about one, one inch or two, 2.5 centimeters. And what we actually found using boat, so this is me driving the boat and the drones above us here as we are going through here. We have the vegetation on the shoreline. I don't have a picture of that in this, in this right here, is that we would need five inch, one inch diameter uh, poles to a, to a width of 10 meters offshore at a cost of just two, over $2 million just for the poles themselves, not including the mounting onto the bottom, not including the labor. To put vegetation, artificial vegetation, which is far cheaper than real vegetation, to put artificial vegetation on this shoreline would be near $5 million. So what they did is they simply put up a rock wall because it was far less expensive, a non-natural shoreline. So next year, what we're doing is we're extending our studies to better look at the different types of configurations of lakes. We're gonna be working on Lake Manitowabing, uh, which is again, just north of Perry Sound. Uh, it has a very complex shape to it, but it's a complex shape because it used to be a river system and it was dammed in the late 1800s, which means the vast majority of the shorelines are not in equilibrium with the wind waves or the wakes. And in fact, they apologize for the noise in the background here. Um, it shouldn't even have big waves because they were, it was a river. So it's eroding at an extremely fast rate, but it's got a large number of boats. We're also gonna be working on Otter Lake, just south of Perry Sound, a natural lake, very different configuration. Again, um, big resort, as well as a wakeboard marina um, that is, is quite popular. And so what we're hoping is that next year, we'll also be able to work on your lake and, uh, and be able to deploy some of our sensors. The sensors that we deploy normally off the shelf are $10,000 a piece. The student in yellow who you see here, his name is Ben Chittle. He's a, going into a third year computer science program. He has figured out how to build them for only $100 a piece. So we've got an entire suite of them. And uh, they're a simple sensor that we put on the bottom. We download them once a month. We put them on a cement block just offshore, about a one meter of depth of water, or we strap them to a leg of a dock. And uh, what we're looking for, and these are approximate locations on your lake, we're looking for sites around your lake that we can deploy these sensors because you've got a very different configuration than all the other lakes that we've looked at. You've got a very different set of problems. Um, and, and so we wanna be able to capture what's happening here relative to everywhere else. We're looking for volunteers who are interested in having a sensor placed at their cottage. All that is required is that we have access to that sensor once a month and just add the permission to be on the property to download the sensor. It takes about a half an hour and then we're gone again. If you are interested in um, participating in this program, simply hold up your iPhone or your any smartphone to the QR code that you see in this image here, take an image of it and it will take you to our website where you can fill out a quick survey and point to your, to your location on the lake. And that's all it is, it's just a simple sensor that we're deploying. And I'm now going to open it up, uh, Kirsten, to any questions that people have, but I'm gonna stop sharing um, so that you, I can actually see the questions that are in fact coming through. Sounds good. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, keep yourself muted if you have any questions. Thank you so much, uh, first of all, Dr. Hauser, for a, a great presentation there. and. Uh, exciting news uh, about this coming to our lake um, so which is which is really going to be handy for us all to have this data that we can um, then uh, present to our other LKO members um, at this point in time there is a question that was sent in oh, shucks a doodle the my 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 thing has frozen. Tanya, I'm going to ask you to read out the question for me um, because if, for some reason the my my it's not allowing me to get into the chat function. So if that would be okay, I apologize for this. Normally this doesn't happen, but there's something frozen on my screen and I can't access it. So if you wouldn't mind, there's one question, uh, Chris, that um, uh, if you wouldn't mind, thank you, Lance. We'll get to yours in just a second. Um, uh, if you wouldn't mind reading it out, Tanya, that has been sent in. 
<laughs> not a problem. Uh, the person says, I'm always concerned that our lakes may be cesspools of captured petroleum sewage wasted, uh, trapped in the sludge on the bottom. The turbulence caused uh, by artificially creative ways must surely be releasing these toxins. I noticed that my boat and dock are particularly greasy after a busy weekend with its endless wake boat and ski and ski do traffic or sorry, sea do traffic. Why uh, is no one addressing this toxic reality and only worried about shoreline erosion? So in fact, I, I, we started from a shoreline erosion perspective because that's what I've always done in my career. And I was sitting at my dock and wondering what was happening to my shoreline. But as I, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, sediment resuspension, bottom resuspension is a big problem. And that is one of the focuses this year with the data that we collected from Lake Muskoka and Joseph, we are looking at the distribution of wave periods associated with boat wakes and wind waves to figure out um, how they are different and to what depth are they penetrating down into the water. The depth at which a wave penetrates is based upon the period of the wave. So the longer the period of the wave, the deeper that it actually can penetrate down towards the bottom. As a result, boat wakes typically have longer periods, greater penetration than that of the wind wave that we typically find on our smaller cottage country lakes that have are fetch limited or have very limited um, length. So that is one of the main focuses that we are wanting to look at. Um, I didn't bring it up here because it's still a work in progress. Uh, we have a swim buoy that we got from the city of Kincardine that we are planning to put into Lake Whitestone this coming summer. And it would sit out in front of my cottage simply because I can watch it for a couple of weeks while, and, and see how it's working. But it's going to have not only a wave sensor, but turbidity sensors, as well as other environmental sensors to look at as the wakes are going through during those periods of heavier activity. Do we see more sediment being resuspended? Do we see more gunk mm -hmm. right, the muck being resuspended? What are the implications? And then, as I mentioned, anything that might have settled to the bottom is obviously being resuspended at that time. But then there's also the direct um, pollution associated with um, boats moving through gas, et cetera. So uh, yes, it is. I think it is a really important piece to it. And that's where from the Lake Roslyn data, we really need to better st understand that sort of resuspension and penetration to the bottom. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Next, next I'm going to go to the, I'm going to go actually to Lance right now, if Tanya. Okay, sorry. Yep. That's okay. okay. We're going to go to Lance. Lance, if you wanted to, uh, I'm going to try and spotlight you if I can. Maybe I can't. No, I don't think I can. But Lance, have a go at your question. A okay. uh, couple just clarifications, Dr. Hauser, of the uh, presentation. The first one was on the Savannah Lake, the uh, original study that you did. You did it like a counter evaluation or you looked at the, the report and so forth. So did, did you submit the data and sort of what effect did that have on any policy related to what happened on that lake for the, for example, for the Australian team and so forth? Did it, like what pack, data package did you use or was there something used to, uh, to address the issue? So I did, the, I did the calculations myself, just doing uh, just some basic analysis to do the backtracking and and there's and and to be able to predict wind waves etc uh we were it, it, there's some very easy uh, calculations to make to, to to do that from the boat wake data we then use the exact assumptions that were used in the good day report as to how many times the australian team was passing etc so we mm -hmm. used all that that very basic data that was then submitted to the residents association or the homeowners association for lake conway who then were going to present it in a court case against the wakeboarding association and the Australian team. Okay. However, it was a homeowners association against a national lobby association. And they realized they did not have the funds in which to actually proceed forward. So that report is with the homeowners association and uh, it is free and available for anybody who would like a copy of it. Okay, and just to clarify, would you suspect that the boats that the wake boats that were used then um, are quite different than where they are now with the sort of ballast weights and so forth? Is that 
I, I do not know. Um, I haven't been in touch with them in a, in two years. Uh, they've gone uh -huh. extremely quiet on the issue. And so I don't know what, what boats are happening there. What's the activity happening on the lake now? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Vince. Thank you Thank so you. much. Um, I have another question from Ian um, wanting to know, do you have any data about the effect of lakes, uh, sorry, sorry, the effect of wakes on loons and other wildlife? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I, I, as a, as a geomorphologist, I like to play with sand and waves, and so I typically avoid anything that is alive. Um, but that's really for, there, there's so much opportunity for others to be studying what is the impact of boat activity on lakes with respect to loons and other wildlife. I know there's been some work done at the University of Windsor in the um, biology program, looking at the impact of recreational boats on noise and how that might interfere with uh, fish and fish behavior. Uh, but beyond that, I really don't have much more information on the wildlife side. Okay, thank you. We're being told, another question is, we're being told we cannot put up a break wall of any sort since there's a big push to leave shorelines natural. Is there any uh, compromise such as a row of rocks, large, small, or combination? Are you suggesting we add some kind of break wall? Um, I've never been a big fan of breakwater simply because they, they will eventually collapse. Break most of the erosion that we uh, we experience on lakes, and it's very site specific, so it's not a I don't want to generalize too much here, but is associated with the the sediment being moved along the shoreline. Breakwaters are great to stop a wave hitting the shoreline straight on, but if your erosion is being moved offshore or along the shoreline, a breakwater doesn't have any impact, and eventually you are simply going to erode down the breakwater will simply collapse. And that we see that a lot on Lake Erie with very unconsolidated sediment. I actually don't know a lot about your shoreline, whether it's rocky, sandy, mucky, what it might be like. That's something that I need to, to learn more about. But whenever you put up a break wall, um, you are then going to create reflected waves. The other is that if you have a sandy shoreline and you put up a break wall, the person beside you is going to have the negative impact and they're going to have to put up a break wall. One break wall means another break wall means another break wall. You're just simply moving that or translating the problem along the shoreline. But again, just to go back, it is very much shoreline specific. So I can't generalize to your shoreline based upon where you're at. Um, then what we need, what I'd be able to do is look a little bit more at individual shorelines and give you a better perspective as to what might be happening at your particular site. If you don't mind, I'm going to turn on the light because I've realized I've gone dark here in my room. You have. I was going to mention that. Um, that is the, the sunlight. There we are. There, there he's back in there. Um, I was just wondering, thank you for that. Uh, we'll go to John Cowan. John, are you, you have a question for us? Uh, Feel free yes, to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you very much for your uh, fascinating, uh, mind-blowing analysis. I understand that you've said it's very site specific and what's going on, but uh, have you, do you know any jurisdictions that have come up with any effective policies uh, as a result of what you're thinking of so far? No, and in fact, we, I have one student, her name is Ava, she has been doing a international search of all boating regulations associated with speed and wakes. The vast majority of them have to do with safety, which is that within 30 meters of the shoreline, you can't be going 10 kilometers an hour. And that really doesn't have much of an impact. Uh, and so that really seems to be the, the precedent around the world. There are a few locations that are looking at wakes, but you just look at some of the, look at some small little lakes and they'll have a, a no wake zone or a less than 10 kilometer an hour zone. Well, what does no wake actually mean? Because in order to do a no wake, you've got no control of your boat. So there's a bit of a problem there you're going so slow and you've got no ability to turn properly. The second is that if you go eight kilometers an hour, you could be plowing your boat and creating the biggest waves possible. Right. So speed is not the actual answer to this. It's some combination, but we have found no legislation that has been effective and specific enough around the world. Have no wake rules uh, had an effect anywhere? I mean, we have no wake signs on uh, Keshek Wigamok in narrow channels and the like, and we maybe should have more, but. Uh, it, it, but again, it, I, I've never seen any data that says what the impact of no wake actually is. And that's 
So we've never we've never done a study where I can control to say here's a wake, here's no wake zone, and how they're being impacted. If you have a no wake zone, people do tend to adhere to it. They do go slow. They try to just simply plane along the surface, um, but it's still really it's such a small zone and it's more about safety than anything else. True. Thank you, John. Thank you for that. Um, it's just as a reminder to anybody, if anyone wants a copy of the studies of that Chris has done or learn about um, his research or any follow-up questions, feel free to email him at chauser at uwindsor.ca. So chauser at uwindsor.ca. Um, another question would be um, another question is great uh, or a statement. Great presentation. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Hauser. Bottom line: Is it better to be further away from the shore when boating or not? Yes, because and because of that dispersion and the fact that the waves separate away from each other, you get that dispersion, which means that at first they're really clumped together and big. As they disperse, they do get smaller, and as they get closer towards, as they move towards the shoreline, they are getting smaller. You also get a dissipation of the wave that at the first wave that is moving forward has to plow into flat water and it takes a lot of energy. So not only are they dispersing and spreading apart, they're also getting smaller because they're pushing against flat water. So the further you are away from the shoreline, the smaller the wave that will be generated. Thank you. Um, and just to clarify another question that's come in for the purpose of the study, these sensors would be only available on Kashagawigamaga. I think this person might have a uh, ulterior motive maybe for another lake <laughs> uh, we would love to do another lake i've only got one ben chittle to actually make these sensors and i've got um not in addition to manitowabing uh otter we're keeping some at muskoka in terms of joseph and rosso uh whitestone and we've been asked by the uh, national park service in michigan to put sensors up wow. in northern michigan so we're being a little pulled apart here at the moment in terms of sensors, but if we have extra sensors and people are interested, do fill out that survey and uh, we will um, be able to, to see what we can do. Yes, because I think another person's interested in it, uh, thinking specifically about Sawyer's, like, uh, which is near, it's one of the connecting, uh, we're a part of the five chain, so it's connecting to our lake. Uh, so they're wondering what studies. So maybe perhaps that they can just uh, email you and get, get in touch with you and fill out the form and, and they can go from there. Um, did you have a question that came in, Tanya, that you would like to read? Yeah, it was also for Canning Lake. People on Canning Lake are interested in sensors as well. That's which wonderful. Is connect, which is another connecting lake. Yeah, it just shows how important the topic is. Was that the question? Yeah, it was, yeah, how Perfect. cash, because they have a, or canning lake, because they have the uh, small canning is average of 12 feet and is only uh, 900 feet at its widest. So the residents are very concerned with the effects of wake boats and jet skis. So they were wondering how they can be part of the study. That's great. Okay. Um, we will put the QR code back up on the screen in a minute. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, but there's another question there. Who, oh, there it is there. Uh, feel free to. Thank you, uh, Chris. Um, the other question is, who is funding the study on Cash Lake? And will the study be provided by the provided to the uh, Halliburton County and to the Ontario Ministry of Environment and the Federal Development of Environment? So Department. All of my boat wake studies are extra studies. Most of my work, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is on beach dune interaction focused in Prince Edward Island. Uh, but these boat wake studies are simply funded by my own internal research funds, uh, discretionary funds. Uh, so there's no external body that is providing us that, uh, that funding. Uh, all that data is going into a, a report that goes to every cottage association that is participating in our studies. And then uh, it is then published in the refereed uh, literature at, with, with reviews to make sure that it stands up, the, up to the science. But then whenever we do these things, they eventually make their way to any uh, local government organization. Okay, wonderful. Um, I, I should also note that I don't, again, because I don't have any stake in this game, I also don't do any of the... Um, the outreach associated with the results. My re my role is just to simply collect the data, figure out what's going on, but also to provide the science background here. Mm. Interesting. Um, well, thank you for that. As I say, we're we're extremely excited to be a part of this research study and and to be a part of that. And we have put up the QR there on the screen and. Uh, 
as Chris had mentioned, make sure anyone's interested uh, to having the sensor placed at their cottage, scan that, or I guess, I guess if they can't use their phone and scan, use the QR code, they can definitely email you saying they're interested. Is that fair to say? That's correct. Okay, perfect. And that's chauser at uwindsor.ca. Um, is there any more questions? Oh, Wendy Hampson, I see Wendy Hampson has a, call, a question. Go ahead, Wendy. Yeah, Chris, I was just wanting to know for the people who might be interested in, in taking you up on the offer of putting in a, a sensor, are you looking for a particular kind of shoreline, whether rocky or marshy or sandy mm -hmm. beach? Yeah, we, we look for a diversity of different types of shorelines. So when you fill out the survey, you're going to go in and, and there will actually be a map of the lake. And I want you to point at the approximate location of your, 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 your place. From that, we will be able to then look at air photos, et cetera, figure out what are the different, different lake configurations, where those locations are, and then try to figure out what's the best combination of sites that we can actually use that gives us that diversity that also gives us the different um, orientations on the lake. Great. And so some, but, sorry, sorry go ahead. question. This, this particular slide that you're showing with the scan me, um, can you send it to us so that we can put it on an e-blast out to the, our lake member association members? Yeah, I'm going to um, put a copy of the presentation. Now it's a big presentation because it's got all the videos. What I might do is send a uh, save a separate one. Yeah, just if someone wants to screenshot this right now, if Actually, someone could, could do that, um, that would be ideal. And then can yeah. uh, and then you can just sc screenshot that, and then you can send it to us. Uh, someone from the board, we can do that, and we can post that, um, sure. and go from there. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and uh, and otherwise, if anyone's interested, they can uh, certainly email Chris. But what you're saying, Chris, is that uh, to to just follow up on Wendy's question that sometimes when you go to see their site, that they it may not be chosen, so they shouldn't get disappointed. <laughs> That's right. It's just simply because we've got a limited number of sensors right. to work with. Yeah, and they want they want the diversity, so don't be disappointed if your place is not chosen uh, for that. Um, but there you go. Um, is there any other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to hand it over to Kathy, another board member. Uh, anybody have any other questions? For, um, oh, there might be one more here. Sorry, just one second. Um, after this, I'm afraid to go boating. <laughs> Someone's mentioned, and we'll definitely keep any clams away from the shoreline. Uh, very good there, Gary. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, does anybody else have any other questions other than otherwise? Oh, they seem very good, Gary. Um, otherwise, I will uh, hand it off to uh, Kathy. Let me just find where she is. There she is. There's Kathy. I will spotlight Kathy for you. There we go, everybody. Hi, Kathy. Well, Chris, thank you ever so much for your fantastic presentation. It's given us so much to think about, and we're all hoping to be part of your study. We'd like to give you an honorarium, which is here to come to you um, by mail yeah. as a thank you from all of us. Um, and we look forward to uh, seeing how this uh, turns out. And uh, we certainly hope that we can be helping you along the way. So thank you so much from all of us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I just wanted to finish up by saying, don't forget there's one more seminar to come along. It's um, on April 26th. That's also a Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. And it, it's entitled All Things Septic, Care, Maintenance, and Inspections of Residential Septic Systems. And that's by Rob Davis. And uh, we're all in this year for uh, septic um, awareness. So I hope that we'll have a good turnout. So thanks very much again and good evening. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, and thanks, Kathy. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.